The interwar years saw a sharp rise in followers of spiritualism throughout Europe and the wider world. Closed curtains in family houses in the most benign suburban neighbourhoods hid seance circles congregated in dark rooms as mediums addressed the realm of the spirits, pulled objects from flowers to live animals out of thin air and delivered messages from those long deceased. In 1938, the Fieldings from South London became the latest in a long line of victims of ghostly disturbances that ramped into a full-blown investigation, as Alma, the young brunette matriarch, found herself quickly sucked into a world of mediumship, complete with multiple spirit guides, apparating terrapins and phantom tigers. As the supernormal world around her got more extreme, Nandor Fodor, acclaimed psychical investigator, dug for more earthly explanations into phenomena that he'd later describe as sending shivers down his spine. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Dark Histories, Season 4, Episode 21. I hope you're all doing very well. I'm Ben, as always. This week, before we start, I've just got one really quick message that I want to get out to everyone, and that's if you would like to send in submissions for the annual Dark Histories Christmas Campfire episode, which will be happening, as always, if you're not aware, in December. It's a bonus episode that I put out around Christmas where we kind of celebrate the very old school tradition of telling ghost stories at Christmas. So what we do, if you've got like personal stories um, that you'd like to share, sort of creepy stories, they don't have to be ghost stories, but, you know, kind of like those kind of weird things that might have happened to you in your life. If you've got stories you want to share, send them in to me. I read them out, create the episode and release it usually sort of 23rd, 24th of December. It's kind of just a, a nice reinvention of, of the, the the very old fashioned sort of Victorian tradition of telling ghost stories around the fire on Christmas. So yeah, if you want to get involved, please definitely do send those in every year. They, these are like by far my favourite episode to make all year and I look forward to it all year because I get everyone's submissions. I get to read them. They're so much fun to read. So I, I've been looking forward to it all year. So yeah, if you do have a story, definitely, definitely send it in. All you've got to do when you send it in, just leave a little note if you want to be anonymous. Um, just just say at the end of your email, or at the start of your email, or whatever. Like you know, I'd I'd rather you didn't read my name out. Um, and then I, obviously I won't credit it to to your name. But otherwise, yeah, do get in touch. Do send them in. Um, submissions are open from now pretty much. I have actually already had some submissions, which is amazing because of, so I've not even asked for them yet. So that's really exciting, and it and it it, it kind of shows that this year is going to be a good one, I think. Every year it's gotten bigger and better, so hopefully this year will be the, our biggest and best year. So I'm going to set a deadline for this. Um, it'll be t- about, about the 20th of December, let's let's say. In fact, I'm making it up right now as we speak. Uh, let's say the deadline is the, the 20th of December because then that'll give me a few days to get the episode together before it needs to come out. So yeah, deadline, 20th December. If you want to email them, please do. The email for um, submissions and things like that is uh, socials at darkhistories.com. That's S-O-C-I-A-L-S at darkhistories.com. I'll put a link for that in the show notes anyway. So yeah, that's what I wanted to say. And with that said, let's get on with this week's episode. This is Nandor Fodor and the Alma Fielding Poltergeist. When one speaks of spiritualism... The most natural association is one of the Victorian boudoir, where seances held behind crushed velvet curtains were a common reaction towards the advancements of modernism, tearing up traditional understanding of spirituality and opening the door to new ways of perceiving the realms of both the living and the dead. It's less common for people to imagine a much later period in time, when enlightened thought was thought to have prospered and superstition supernormality and the occult worlds of the spirit mediums were considered a quaint historical footnote. The onset of war in 1914, however, ushered in a new era of spiritualism, seeing the number of spiritualist societies more than double before the end of the war. It began for many on the battlefields of Europe, where angels appeared in trenches, spirit armies protected platoons of soldiers, wisps of the dead walked carelessly across front lines, and fallen comrades gave messages in dreams to the friends that they had left behind. For many more, 
It was a helping hand for those left at home, facing a new future alone. In the years following the First World War, the nations of Europe fell into a collective national mourning, with over 20 million estimated deaths, 9 million of which were servicemen and women fighting on fronts far from home, lost in trenches and seas, buried in battlefields. Few families escaped the loss of a relative or friend. In some areas, towns and smaller communities lost entire generations of their young adult populations. Within this environment of collective loss, and with so many cases lacking any definitive closure for the connected families, spiritualism completed its resurgence. This, however, is only half the story. In the years leading up to the Second World War, spiritualism continued to rise in popularity. In the 1930s, once the early wounds of the First World War were beginning to heal, the popular interest in spiritualism, mediumship, the supernormal and psychical investigation only continued to grow. Famous mediums packed halls and gave enthralled audiences demonstrations of table tipping, speaking with the dead and apparating objects from otherworldly realms. In London, the Royal Albert Hall gave an audience of over 10,000 the opportunity to hear the recently deceased author and famed spiritualist Sir Arthur Conan Doyle speak from the grave through Estelle Roberts, aided by her guide, Red Cloud, the spirit of a deceased Native American Indian. In private homes across Britain, The Psychic News, a UK-based weekly spiritualist newspaper with a global audience whose editor himself was a claimed spirit medium, estimated over 100,000 seance circles were in operation, communicating with the other side on every night of the year. There were, of course, the celebrities that helped to perpetuate the acceptance of the supernormal. Outside of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Famous investigators of the supernormal, like Harry Price, the founder of the National Laboratory of Psychical Research, both exposed and endorsed psychic mediums through a hungry press. Spiritualist literature, which had found itself a new bestseller status, became accessible to a much larger audience, with continued reprintings and multiple translations. As it continued to grow, the more secular organisations sought to thwart spiritualism, with Catholicism in particular making concerted efforts to stain the belief practices with demonic connotations. However, with spiritualism pushing a brand of contemporary politics and framing itself as a democratic organisation with no allusions to power and riding the wave of the popular average man, it was coming up against a loud and large opposition. Spiritualism was at once for the investigation of lofty intellectual theories on the afterlife and accessible for the unintellectual but intelligent. In short, it was a populist movement with modern leanings and the protestations of stuffy old institutions who sought to control the playing field of beliefs were seen as nothing more than blusterings of the self-interested. If spiritualism wasn't already cemented into society by the late 1930s, then the run-up to the Second World War would ensure that the job was complete. Anxieties rose throughout the populations of the European nations who had entire generations still suffering from the aftermath of the First World War. Spiritualism and stories of the seance circles provided a natural distraction, an escape and an added comfort to those who once more were reminded of the horrors of war and the old wounds that were scratched open. As newspapers reported on the movements of Hitler's forces into Austria in 1938 on one page, they wrote of ghosts, poltergeists, seances and mediums on the other. One such story was that of a small suburban dwelling in Croydon, owned by the Fieldings, whose home, declared the Sunday pictorial on the 20th of February 1938, had been wrecked by ghosts. The headline in the very next column took up almost as much space as the photograph of the cowering Fielding family next to it. It read simply, Hitler in large, bold, italicised capital letters. Alma Smith was born in Pimlico, London in 1903. The second daughter of Charles and Alice Smith, she had an elder sister, Doris, who had been born three years earlier, and a younger brother, Charles, who was born much later in 1915. By the time of Charles's birth, Alma had moved with her family to Thornton Heath, a small town south of the Thames, that had been enveloped by the expanding metropolitan suburb 
linking Croydon to central London. She had dreams of working as an entertainer and took training from one of her uncles in the circus-like skills of tightrope walking, trapeze and acrobatic. But in her mid-teens, she took a spill on a bicycle that permanently gave her physical difficulties, more or less ending her ambitions of stardom. In truth, she had been a relatively sickly child even before then, but the accident had been the final nail in the coffin, leading her to suffer from prolonged issues with her kidneys that wound up in several surgeries to drain an abscess. In March of 1921, Alma married Les Fielding in a shotgun wedding. Her parents weren't supportive of the marriage, but with Alma secretly three months pregnant, their protestations fell on deaf ears. Les had left school aged 14 and become his father's apprentice as a young painter and decorator until the outbreak of war in 1914 saw him join up to fight. After his return from the fighting, he started his own painting and decorating business, though he still carried a souvenir of his time on the Western Front in the form of shrapnel from a hand grenade embedded in his right thigh. That and the dreams he had occasionally of his throat being cut on the battlefield. Their son... Donald was born in 1922, shortly after the couple had settled into their home on Beverston Road, Thornton Heath, where they lived together with their dog, Judy, and a lodger named George Saunders, who moved into the Fieldings in 1928 after the breakdown of his marriage and had stayed with the family since. George had suffered a footballing injury when he was aged seven years old that had left him walking on crutches, though it didn't stop him leading a relatively ordinary life and he earned a living mending shoes in town. Alma and Les lived reasonably comfortably, and Les's painting and decorating work saw him kept busy and well paid due to the expansion of the suburbs all around them. By 1938, Don was a young man himself, and after leaving school, he followed in his father's footsteps, working under Les as an apprentice. From the outside, it may appear as though the Fieldings were living happy families. Money was never abundant, but life cruised for the most part, and they lived in relative quiet. There is, of course, the age-old adage that life was not always what it seemed, and just under the surface, there was a darkness that bubbled away behind the doors of Beverston Road, and in the spring of 1938, it threatened to boil over. The first signs that things were not altogether usual in the family home came to Alma and Les Fielding in the early days of February 1938. Alma had been out visiting friends while she left Les at home in bed. A few days before, Les had undergone dental surgery to remove his remaining teeth to make way for a set of dentures and so she had left him recovering at home. While she played cards and chatted amongst her friends, Alma felt a sharp pain come on in her pelvis that forced her to excuse herself early from the gathering. When she arrived home, she dropped a few pain meds along with a sedative and slipped into bed beside her husband. As she lay in the room, drifting off to sleep, she noticed a handprint with six digits appear in the mirror above the mantelpiece. The imprint was clear to Alma, who described it to Les later that week, who confirmed that he too had seen such a print whilst he had been at work. The house that he had been working in had been completely empty aside from himself and his son, Yet somehow, this mysterious imprint appeared to Les to follow him about, leaving its marks in green paint. It was certainly weird, but little more was said about the matter until the following Friday night on the 19th of March. Alma and Les were laying in bed around midnight when they were woken by a shattering thump in the room. Alma turned on the light on her bedside table and found a glass tumbler smashed on the bedroom floor. The tumbler had usually sat on Les's side of the bed every night, but both Alma and Les had been asleep and there was no one else in the room. As they were staring at the broken shards, a second glass hit the bedroom wall with a sharp crack and two shattered across the bedroom floor. Alarmed, Les suggested to Alma that she turn the light off, but as soon as the darkness spread across the room, the couple felt a cold snap hit and the duvet flew up into their faces. Les quickly changed his mind about the light and he called to Alma to turn it back on, but though she pulled the chain hanging from the underside of the lamp, the light remained off. Beginning to panic, Alma called for help and their son, Don, came into the room, followed by the lodger, George. As both men entered the room, they were hit by objects, 
Don a small jar of face cream, and George by two pennies, a one shilling piece and a one pence piece wrapped off of his chest. Still struggling with the light, Don went downstairs to collect a box of matches, and when he returned and struck one, Alma and Les saw that the bulb in the lamp had simply vanished. Puzzled, they looked about the room, peering through the dim light of the burning match, and they found the bulb, unbroken but still hot from use, resting in the nursing chair next to the bed. Once the bulb was returned, calm restored to the Fielding household, and 30 minutes later, at around 12.40am, the family returned to an uneasy sleep, hoping to put the incident out of their minds. Things are never quite so easy, however, and the very next morning, when Alma rose and went to the kitchen to make breakfast, she was sharply reminded of the events from the previous night as an egg smashed into the kitchen wall. Quickly deciding that vanishing light bulbs and levitating eggs were not the usual things to happen on a given weekend, Alma called up the Sunday Pictorial, a weekly paper that made shallow attempts at balancing news journalism with entertainment and fluff pieces. In recent months, it had been running a series of stories about spiritualism, ghosts and otherworldly phenomena, asking readers to send in their stories. Instantly interested in the story, the paper agreed to send two reporters around that evening to get in on the strange happenings, and by early afternoon, Victor Thompson and Lionel Crane two of the paper's local reporters were walking up the short path to the small terraced house on Beverston Road. What they witnessed that day was printed in the paper the very next day under the headline, Terror in Home Wrecked by Ghost. Two Sunday pictorial representatives, Victor Thompson and Lionel Crane, yesterday spent the most amazing day in their lives. In a neat little house at Thornton Heath, they saw miracles wrought by some malevolent ghostly force. They saw saucers, held in a woman's hand, exploded into smithereens by an invisible power. Eggs, saucepans, vendors, rugs, wine glasses, coal, and a score of other objects sailed through the air before them, and sometimes, apparently, right through closed doors, propelled by no human force. It is the most amazing case of a poltergeist or mischievous spirit ever known. The occupants of the house are Mr. and Mrs. Leslie Fielding, and their 16-year-old son, Donald. They have a lodger, Mr. George Saunders. A few years ago, the imprint of a hand with five fingers appeared on a mirror here, Mrs. Fielding told Victor Thompson and Lionel Crane. Since then, crash! A story was interrupted by a noise in the hall. Our representatives ran out of the living room and found that a heavy bronze fender from an upstairs bedroom had been hurled down the stairs. Nobody was upstairs. Mrs. and Mr. Fielding said dozens of happenings like that had occurred in the last 12 hours. Tumblers had been hurled across rooms and smashed against the wall. A pot of vanishing cream had fallen, apparently through a ceiling, onto Mrs. Fielding's head. Our men themselves saw the following miracles. A saucer held in Mrs. Fielding's hand smashed into fragments, cutting her badly. Eggs and crockery hurtling from the kitchen and falling at their feet. A saucepan floating in the air a wine glass apparently coming right through the door of a heavy oaken sideboard. Late last night, the eerie manifestations were still occurring. I feel some terrible climaxes approaching, said Mrs Fielding. We shall stay up all night to see it through. I hope it comes soon. Our nerves cannot stand much more. It was typical of the Sunday pictorial in its prose, vague and exciting, giving enough of the story to have a foot in believability whilst tossing out bold claims with little evidence. Still, the events reported were later confirmed in separate interviews, including the gash on Alma's hand, which had occurred as a small tea plate she was holding smashed, as if crushed by a vice grip. What wasn't reported at the time was the reporters' ingenuity when they addressed the crowds forming outside the home in order to find someone who may be sensitive to the phenomena that was happening around them. Dragging out one Professor Morrison, a self-proclaimed psychic, from the lingering public, he entered the house and walked through the rooms in deep thought, before exclaiming that Alma was herself a sensitive and a very strong carrier of ectoplasm. If that wasn't thrilling enough, he warned the group that the experiences were a warning to the family and that their son Donald was in danger. It was enough to see the boy off and he spent the next several weeks staying with family away from the house. This did free up his bedroom, however, and over the next few days, 
Reporters used it to stay the night and write up the peculiar activity. With the story hitting the papers, the events at Beverstone Road instantly drew the attention of the day's psychical investigators. Nandor Fodor, a Jewish Hungarian journalist and sole researcher for the International Institute for Psychical Research based in London, was first out of the blocks to write to the editor of the Sunday Pictorial to inquire after the address of the Fielding family, suggesting that he would cut them in on any hypothetical investigation and report any of his findings to them to print, if indeed anything were to happen. Fodor had worked with the editor before and previously submitted several stories to the paper, so it was a simple deal to strike for both parties, and within hours, Fodor's assistant, Florence Evans, was knocking on the door on Beverstone Road to make a preliminary sweep of the scene. His report was later included in a book published by Fodor in 1958 titled On the Trail of the Poltergeist, though the names of the Fieldings were changed to Forbes. This was my first experience in the house, and I think it is in the highest standard of the phenomena. Incidentally, I found during that day, and subsequently, that a phenomenon of the more startling variety would almost invariably occur within about 10 minutes of the arrival in the house of any new visitor. Whilst I was upstairs, two loud crashes were heard from the front room that we had just left. The only inhabitants who were downstairs at the time were two friends of the Forbes, who were in the back room. They were in the act of coming out into the hall as I ran down the stairs. In the front room, a large glass salad bowl was in pieces in the fireplace and a wine glass lay broken in the sideboard. Mrs Forbes gave me an estimate of the damage and breakages in the house in the 72 hours since the disturbances started. They included the following. 36 tumblers, 24 wine glasses, 15 egg cups, 5 teacups, 4 saucers, 1 salad bowl, 3 electric bulbs, 9 eggs, 2 plates, 1 pudding basin, 2 vases, 1 water jug, one jar of face cream, and one milk jug. In addition, an aluminium saucepan had on three occasions been practically flat. That is to say, the sides had been pressed in towards the centre, which took considerable force, but was not beyond a normal man's strength. Also in the front room was a brass ornamental kettle, which was deeply indented in several places. This, Mrs Forbes told me, was due to a heavy glass decanter having been repeatedly thrown at it. On looking through my notes on the Thornton Heath case made on my first visit to the house, February the 23rd, I experienced afresh the feeling I had at the time. That is to say, an utter belief in the genuineness of the phenomena and also in the good faith of Mrs Forbes. As Fodor read the report from the assistant, he felt a twinge of excitement. In the covering letter, Evans concluded, I unhesitatingly label it as supernormal. Nandor Freidlander was born in Berekszáz, Hungary, on May 13th, 1895. He was the 16th of 18 children. He grew up to study law at the Royal Hungarian University of Science, graduating in 1917, and went on to work as a legal assistant. Though it wasn't long before his talent in writing and curiosity about the world broke out and led him to taking a job as a journalist at AZS. Founded in 1906, the paper had rocketed in popularity to be the most read newspaper in Hungary. His work at Azest afforded him the opportunity to work in New York, where he moved to in 1921 after taking a job writing for the American Hungarian People's Voice. Whilst in New York, his life changed in a couple of key ways. Firstly, he married Irene Lichter in 1922, and a year later, the couple gave birth to Andrea, their daughter, Secondly, Fodor discovered the vast collection of material published on matters of the psychical and the supernormal. Fodor himself had been curious from a young age on topics that skirted along the fringe after he had attended his grandfather's funeral and heard his dead relatives speak to him in Hebrew as he lay in his coffin. Unable to understand Hebrew, it was a memory that both pulled him in and frustrated him simultaneously. Immersing himself in the literature of the psychical researchers of the day, Fodor took a sceptical but enthusiastic view on the subject, and before long, he began visiting and partaking in seance circles throughout New York. He used his journalistic connection to meet several prominent spiritualists and psychical researchers and dove into the subject head first. Though, as a fan of Freud, whom he had interviewed in 1926, 
His approach was always one of careful analysis and carried a strong psychoanalytical bent. In 1927, three years after the death of his father, he communicated with his spirit through a medium in one circle, though the medium was later criticised in psychical literature as a fraud. Meanwhile, his work in journalism continued to shine and in 1928 he was offered a position in London as an advisor to Hungarian affairs. Working for the newspaper giant Lord Rothermere, founder of both the Daily Mail and the Daily Mirror and owner of Associated Newspapers Limited, Rothermere also owned the previously mentioned Sunday Pictorial. It was a lucrative position with a lavish salary and Fodor strolled his way down Fleet Street to work in the morning and spent his evenings diving further into the spirit world, giving lectures and writing for psychical journals. In 1934, he became the editor for the spiritualist magazine Light, the oldest and most well-known UK journal on spiritualist matters. In the same year, he published his first book, The Encyclopedia of Psychic Science. A year later, he threw in his well-paid job and took a position as the only paid member of staff at the recently founded International Institute for Psychical Research, based in South Kensington. It was a dramatic step down in terms of salary, but for Fodor, a new world opened up to him, one that allowed him to conduct research and investigations into hauntings, seances, mediumship, and all manner of the supernormal. Like a child in a sweet shop, he went about his business with a characteristic flair and a smile on his face. He was well known for having fun during his ghost investigations especially, where he took a light-hearted approach and found entertainment alongside the intellectual challenge. Despite this jovial approach to the subject, he was also sceptical to a degree and he continued to bring a psychoanalytical approach to his investigations. In 1936, he investigated a case known as the Ash Manor Ghost, where he concluded that suppressed sexual energies had spurred the haunting on. This angle was enjoyable for Fodor. A psychoanalytical point of view meant that even a hoax, and by now he had seen a few, were worthy of serious study. His approach was not always appreciated, however, and many in the psychical community found him to err too much on the side of the sceptic. For the most part, Fodor took attacks from the community on the chin. He had seen one too many fraudulent mediums to believe blindly in many of the supernormal claims, though he continued to investigate with an open view and a fascination with the unknown powers of the human mind. In 1938, he stumbled across the story of Alma and Les in the Sunday Pictorial and instantly found intrigue. Psychical research into poltergeist activity was still in its relative infancy. In spiritualism, it was thought to be the work of malicious or maladjusted spirits, psychokinetic energy or elementals, though from his earlier psychical investigations, Fodor and a few others had their own ideas. The case of Eleanor Zugan in the 1920s had seen a young Romanian girl become possessed by a purported poltergeist, leading to a barrage of paranormal activity, from apportation to stigmatic wounds and possession. In the years following the case's explosion, rumours and accusations of sexual abuse led some more psychoanalytical to theorise that it was the trauma that fed into the phenomena, whether otherworldly or not. Clearly, the case in Beveston Road from the Sunday Pictorial needed looking into. Fodor picked up the phone and called the paper. After the report from his assistant's preliminary visit had proved the activity in the house worthy of investigation, Fodor arranged to visit the fieldings in their home on the following Thursday, the 24th of February. He arrived at 11.30am to find a tired-looking household. Les told him in a heavy voice that he had barely been able to sleep all week since the bizarre activity had started during the previous weekend. Fodor described him as a straightforward, intelligent man, though he noted he looked anxious and worried and suffering from overstrain. Whilst journalists for the Croydon Advertiser had stayed over earlier that week, a wardrobe had fallen over in Don's room where they were staying, narrowly avoiding a painful accident. Alma greeted Fodor and showed him a collection of broken cutlery, glass and china, all victims to the activity of the poltergeist who had spent the week laying waste to as much of the fielding's kitchen as possible. Having read the kind of activity that had been going on in Lawrence Evans's report, Fodor had come to the house forearmed. He pulled out a collection of his own tumblers, placing them on the mantelpiece in the living room and putting an egg in one and a light bulb in another. 
As he arranged the glasses, a thumping crack hit the door behind him, and when he stepped out into the hallway, he found a broken alarm clock lying on the floor. The door to the lounge was freshly scarred from the clock's collision. Amra and Les stepped out behind Fodor and confirmed that the clock was from their bedroom and was usually to be found on the bedside table. Fodor next launched into his questioning of Alma, who he described as charming, intelligent and vivacious. She was keen to get to the bottom of the events in the house, though she too appeared to Fodor to be suffering from nervous strain and visibly twinged with every crash, knock and thud that bounced through the house. He spoke to Alma about previous events before the handprint and asked her if she thought herself psychic, which she answered by saying that she didn't know, but went on to tell Fodor of several stories of uncanny coincidence and apparent prophetic dreams, one where she dreamt that her son Don had come into an accident that had left a strong enough impression on her to warn him to watch out before he left the house in the morning. Later that day, he was hit by a passing bicycle. In the house, Alma recalled stories of how she had felt a cold hand touch her shoulder as she walked down the stairs whilst home alone one day, and of how she had once heard a whispering in the kitchen. She also told Fodor of how their dog had stood in the house, quivering, its hair standing on end. Interestingly, Fodor discovered that neither Alma nor Les were particularly interested in spiritualism, and their son Don was outright sceptical on matters of the supernormal, calling it all just bunk. However, he had found the events in the house frightening enough to have spent all week sleeping elsewhere. As Fodor interviewed the Fieldings, he recorded 29 separate incidents of activity that he ascribed to the poltergeist, though the vast majority were not enough to be definitive proof. Most impressive for Fodor were two occasions when a glass fell onto the kitchen floor in the kitchen whilst all members of the household were in the lounge and in full view of the investigator. The launching of a cup in the direction of Les's head that smashed into the wall whilst Fodor watched on with his colleagues who had arrived just after lunchtime and the smashing of the cat's food dish were two other events that he thought particularly interesting. The smashing of the cat's food dish was witnessed by Dr Wills, another of Fodor's colleagues, who later wrote up what he had seen in a signed statement. Mrs Fielding was standing facing the sink, filling the kettle from the tap. The kettle was in her left hand, her right hand was on the tap. Mr Fielding, just returned from work, had taken off his collar and was in the act of placing it with his left hand on the table. I was standing talking to Mr Fielding, when absolutely, without any preliminaries of any sort of movement on anyone's part, a saucer appeared at two thirds of the height of the door from the floor right way up. It remained in this position for a split second, but long enough to identify it as a saucer. It then split in half with a loud crack and fell vertically to the floor. Other events, mainly in the form of household items from the cat's food bowl to glass tumblers, saucers and teacups flying through the air and smashing off of walls, were numerous. Many of the reports included descriptions of Alma's hands and in many cases they were full or otherwise occupied and so it didn't appear as though she was playing any roles in their destruction. It was clear from the report, however, that Fodor believed Alma to be the centre of the activity as he was clearly watching her closely and scrutinising her movements throughout the house. In the evening, Alma's mother and sister visited the house and Fodor took the opportunity to quiz them on Alma's past. It turned out that she had something of a history in telling wacky stories and her family had playfully written them off as fairy tales. Now, however, they had changed their tune. I've had China break in my hands, Amma's mother told Fodor, and she also recounted a chilling tale of feeling hands tightening around her throat, giving her the sensation of being strangled whilst in the house. By 10pm, Fodor wrapped up the day and having come to the conclusion that there was strong reason to consider Alma as a poltergeist medium, he invited her to attend the Institute in South Kensington, where they could investigate any such links between Alma and the supernormal underneath a more scientific scrutiny. It was the start of an investigation that would eventually be Fodor's undoing, but not before he and the Institute's seance circle would bear witness to some of the most truly bizarre phenomena. The International Institute for Psychical Research sat on the first two floors of Walton House in the London district of South Kensington. 
It had been founded in 1934 as a successor to the earlier Survival League, founded in 1929 by Catherine Amy Dawson Scott, a poet, writer and keen spiritualist. During its founding, it attracted many scientists with its lofty aspirations to investigate psychical phenomena from a scientific angle, though many promptly left after they found its early investigations to be lacking in credibility. Fodor was brought in as the first paid member of staff in 1935, taking over as head of research, utilising a seance room to investigate several prominent mediums, debunking and unmasking the fraudulent activities of several, including Laos Pap, a famous Hungarian medium who could apport items from thin air from snow, flowers and alcohol to live animals, insects and birds. During a seance at the Institute, he apported a dead snake, an act that would have been impressive had Fodor not had the medium searched, where a device was quickly discovered strapped to his leg that was capable of secreting away large objects beneath his clothes. Fodor personally took interest in the why and what fors of fraudulent phenomena. In this way, no investigation was a waste of time for the Institute. Either he discovered genuine, unexplainable phenomena, or he took the opportunity to further research the theories he harboured that our unconscious mind was immensely powerful and equally as strange as anything otherworldly. He launched into every investigation with healthy enthusiasm and instructed his circle to treat even the most fraudulent of mediums with dignity, gentleness and consideration. Alma first visited the Institute at 3pm the following day, Friday the 25th of February 1938. Fodor had laid the seance room out in preparation placing cups and saucers on the chairs, glass tumblers on a table, and he placed inside them a flash bulb and a rattle. The room was scrutinised by the barrel of a photographic camera poised to fire. That afternoon, in front of a small seance circle of investigators, researchers and interested friends, Alma appeared to apparate a small hairbrush and a tin of Carter's Little Liver Pills into the room. The hairbrush, she said, had last been seen on a dressing table in her bedroom on Beverston Road, along with the tin of pills. On both occasions, witnesses claimed that both of her hands were in full view and occupied with a cup and saucer when they heard the items hit the floor. At 5.30pm, just before the group planned to wrap up for the day, the cup and saucer that Alma had been holding flew from her hands and smashed in midair. It looked as if it had been hit in flight with an invisible hammer. Fodor wrote later. That night, Fodor had Alma driven home and several members of the investigation circle stayed back in Beverston Road to check on the activity that was going on there. As it had every night that week, things continued to crash and bounce around the house as soon as Alma arrived home. Alma wore a large coat and Dr. Wills experimented by placing small objects into some of the pockets to see if Alma could make them disappear. Both a watch and a pocket knife vanished from the pockets he placed them in, only to reappear in different places shortly after. Fodor had found the day very exciting indeed. To have Alma come to the Institute and witness continued phenomena was a promising start for the investigation, and he wasted no time in writing an article for the Journal of the American Society for Psychical Research concerning Alma and her poltergeist. There has not been a greater or truer ghost story than this one for many years. I always wanted to meet a poltergeist. Now I have met one. A poltergeist which is certainly destructive, yet not malevolent. In fact, to a certain degree, amenable to experimental suggestions. The Sunday Pictorial took it a step further when it published its follow-up on the Beverston Road piece the following weekend. Houses haunted, declare experts. Scientists who have spent the week investigating the uncanny series of events in a house in Thornton Heath, which I described in last week's Sunday pictorial, are convinced it is a genuine and amazing case of the supernormal. Dr Nandor Fodor, Chief Research Officer of the International Institute for Psychical Research, told me yesterday, My assistant, Mr L.A. Evans and I, have spent most of the week at the house. There is certainly no fraud. We are satisfied there is something supernatural at work there, and we are going on with the investigations. On the same day, Victor Thompson, the reporter who found himself being called to the Fielding's house the Sunday prior, published a large multi-page piece in the newspaper carrying the headline, Spiritualism, My Verdict. 
I have been trying in the Sunday pictorial for the last few weeks to give readers a fair picture of what an ordinary, materialistic man, unversed in such mysteries, finds when he starts to explore the world of spiritualism. I have described visits to mediums and the messages which come through mediums from somewhere. I have told you about public demonstrations of clairvoyance and private seances at which intelligent people have been completely convinced that they are hearing and answering the actual voices of their dead relations. I have also been permitted to attend healing centres and circles of advanced students listening intently to trance orations. And last week, quite fortuitously, I found myself in a house which was apparently infested by a poltergeist, or mischievous spirit, whose chief amusement was hurling household articles through the air. I didn't like that. All the time, I have tried to avoid jumping to conclusions, seeking only to report as conscientiously as I could exactly what I saw and heard. One result has been that some of my friends, and some readers too I expect, are saying, poor old Victor Thompson, he thinks he's a shrewd observer, but obviously he has been fooled all along the line. That sort of criticism comes, of course, only from people who have no personal experience. It is a little like saying, Australia doesn't exist because I have never seen it. I entered this series a doubter. I leave it not a convert, but a very impressed man. I do not know even yet whether the spiritualist descriptions of life after death are true, nor whether their doctrine of reincarnation is correct and so on. But on the central issue of survival, well, the only satisfactory explanation that I can find for what I have seen and heard is that human beings do survive death and can sometimes communicate with this world. Six weeks ago, like millions of people today, I did not believe either of those things. The next day, Fodor went back to Beverston Road to interview Alma extensively concerning her past. During the interview, she told him of her ambitions as a teenager to become an entertainer and of her training with her uncle as well as her bicycle accident which ended it all. In Stranger Stories, she told of how she had lost her sight in 1929 for three weeks, though claimed to still be able to see the world around her through a sensory practice that she couldn't entirely explain. She had managed to keep the event secret for a while until she visited the cinema with Les, who noticed that her eyes were not watching the screen. Les convinced Alma to visit the optician, who sent her to a specialist eye hospital who confirmed her blindness and gave her a course of drops to cure the ailment. After using the medication, her sight eventually returned. It was a peculiar story. However, Alma's next story was even less easy to understand. A year after her incident of temporary blindness, she was visiting friends to play cards one evening when she felt a sudden bout of exhaustion. She lay on the couch in the living room for a while to get some sleep and seemed to quickly drop out of consciousness. During this time that she was out, she had a dream that her dead father walked silently across the room and placed a finger on her chest, tracing a cross on her left breast. When she woke, she found a mark in the shape of a cross on her chest in the place that she had dreamt and after telling Les of the story, he convinced her to go to the doctors to get it checked out. During the doctor's inspection, he found a cancerous tumour in the same breast which ended in Alma requiring a mastectomy to remove the growth. Perhaps the most disturbing story she told Fodor of, however, was that of a strange, long-faced man that she used to see climbing out of her wardrobe and approaching her while she lay in bed as a small child. It was a strange interview, but it had given Fodor a lot to unpack. Much of what she had told him that day could have been explained by known phenomena. In the case of Alma losing her sight, hysterical blindness seemed to be a distinct possibility, and the man creeping out of the wardrobe at night, terrifying as it might have sounded, could easily be attributed to sleep paralysis. Though the dream of her father, Fodor admitted, was less easy to explain. It sparked an interest in Fodor, who began to consider what it might have all meant. Clearly, Alma had been living a life that was in great need of mental escape. She was a strong, imaginative and vivacious young woman who had had dreams of the stage, but wound up living the life of a housewife. Perhaps he began to theorise that Alma was oppressing more than she realised, and perhaps it was this that was causing the phenomena to take place around her. The following Friday, Alma once more visited the Institute to take part in Fodor's seance circle. 
before each seance officially began. He scrutinized Alma closely as she greeted the other members of the circle and socialized amongst them. As they began the investigation, he had Alma taken to a private room where she was searched by two female members of the circle and given a jumpsuit to wear to ensure that she could not slip anything below her own clothes into the room. On the Friday, she told Fodor that during the week, Lezard tried to discourage her from returning to the Institute. It wasn't doing her health any favours, he reasoned. However, when the poltergeist tossed Lezard's shoes into the fireplace and shook the bed that night, he changed tack and agreed that she should perhaps return after all. During the investigation that day, they introduced table tipping to the proceedings, and though there was a series of knocks and wobbles, Fodor concluded that there had been no intelligible phenomena. Alma continued to return to the Institute during the first week of March, but like before, the table tipping appeared to give unsatisfactory results. In an effort to spur on the poltergeist activity, Fodor suggested that the group take an outing to the seaside. On Friday the 11th of March, Fodor, Alma and the rest of the circle arrived in Bognor Regis, a small resort town south of London, complete with a sandy beach, zoo and amusement park. Fodor and the circle, however, were more interested in the high street. On the trip down to Bognor, Alma had told Fodor of how she had been shopping with a friend on the previous day where she had tried on a ring. Handing the ring back to the shop assistant, the pair then left the shop empty-handed, only to find, to both parties' great surprise, that the ring had somehow found its way back onto Alma's finger shortly after. Her friend immediately suggested that they visit another store and try the same with the necklace, and though Alma initially protested, they wound up back at a jewellery counter, perusing strings of pearl necklaces a short while later. Alma had been careful not to touch anything whilst in the store, and as before, the pair left empty-handed. Just as before, however, as soon as Alma stepped onto the tram to head home, she had found a string of pearls hanging round her neck. Fodor was keen to repeat the experiment in Bogner, and so he arranged for the group to visit Woolworth and convinced Alma to try on a ring. Before they entered the store, he handed her a small film canister and suggested it might be interesting if a piece of jewellery could wind up inside it. All the members watched on, witnessing Alma clearly try on and then hand back a ring to the shop assistant and leave the store. As they walked around the corner, a rattle came from the inside Alma's pocket, and when they pulled out the film canister, sure enough, there inside sat the ring that she had tried on in the store. The experience, said Fodor, was rather alarming. Fodor wondered about the psychic thefts and what the motive behind them could have been. Alma did not want for money nor possessions. She lived comfortable enough to afford such things if she wanted them. He did, however, consider both the idea of compulsive theft as well as simply seeking a thrill. If that was the case, however, then how on earth had Alma managed to slip the ring away when they had all seen her clearly hand it back to the shop staff? Throughout March, the seances continued back at the Institute, and each time Alma was stripped, searched, and given a set of clothes to wear whilst in the seance room. On each occasion, items continued to apport from silver charms and pennies to nuts and polished stones. With each new crack, thud and ping of an item hitting the ground, the circle became more enthusiastic for Alma's apparent psychic talent. Meanwhile, back at Beverston Road, things were still growing stranger by the day. One night, the lodger, George, woke Alma and Les by screaming at the top of his lungs. He swore that he had seen Alma standing in his room, staring at him and grinning. But conversely, Les swore that Alma had been in bed when they were woken by his screaming. Don, who had built up the courage to return to the house, complained of how his light would turn on and off by itself constantly throughout the night, and all members of the household complained of a sweet, rotten smell that permeated through the rooms from time to time. At the Institute, Alma was given a contract for her involvement with the investigation, which was now seeing her visit twice a week. Going forward, she was paid £2 a week for her efforts and expected to show up twice weekly for three hours per session. Bodor, however, had decided with the circle to sit out of the seances and take a back seat, handing over the lead to Countess Widenbrook to create a more casual approach to the investigations, including a smaller, 
development circle in order to lead Alma into a more secure sense of mind, one where she might not be so conscious of being scrutinised so heavily, and if she was hoaxing, one in which she might slip up just a little more readily. Born in London, the Countess Weidenbrook was the daughter of Christoph Anton Graf von Weidenbrook, secretary of the Austro-Hungarian Embassy, and Marie von Fugger Babenhausen. Though she had come from high society and spent much of her childhood hobnobbing in Vienna, she had married a painter in 1919 against her parents' wishes and emigrated to London, where the couple scratched out a living as an artist and a writer before coming to prominence in the 30s. The first of the more intimate investigations began at the Institute on the 25th of March. On the train journey to the Institute, Alma had fallen asleep only to wake to find a white mouse perched on her arm. She had brought the mouse with her to the Institute and though Fodor secretly believed that Alma had probably brought the creature on the way, he kept the mouse as evidence of an abort. As Fodor's suspicions began to grow against Alma's legitimacy, the phenomena witnessed at the Institute became more and more sensational and difficult to explain. Alma now told Fodor of how she had gone to the cinema one night and fallen asleep whilst watching a film. She had slipped into a dream state and found herself standing outside of the Institute where she saw many of the cars belonging to the circle arrive. She had not seen Dr. Wills, however, which seemed strange to her. As it turned out, on the night that Alma was describing, the members of the circle had held a meeting at the Institute and they had all driven to the appointment, all except Dr. Wills, who had not been able to attend due to his car breaking down on the way, causing him to miss the meeting. During the time that Alma had spent staring at the Institute in her dream, she mentioned seeing a chauffeur in the street, describing him and saying that he seemed to notice her and eye her suspiciously. Fodor tracked down the chauffeur in question, who remembered seeing a woman fitting Alma's description loitering in the street, and when Fodor introduced the two, both gave positive identifications of the other. Whilst many members of the circle took this to be evidence of astral projection, Fodor remained sceptical, instead chalking it up to a possible case of ambulatory amnesia. Still, it was getting more and more difficult to hand wave away the various phenomena related to Alma, and it was in no way poised to get any easier. As the month drew on, Alma continued to abhor objects during the seances, only now she had graduated from small objects to finding live mice, goldfish, beetles, a waxbill finch, a terrapin and several dead scarabs. She had also began apporting some fairly unusual objects, including antique shards of pottery and an antique silver necklace decorated with silver coins. As the necklace appeared around her neck from thin air, she said it had burned her skin. Fodor found most of all of the items difficult to explain and had spent several afternoons traipsing around the local areas between Thornton Heath and South Kensington, visiting pet shops, antique shops and museums to ask if any of the owners recognised any of the objects or remembered selling any of them to Alma, all to no avail. Along with this appearing of strange items, Alma had also begun to channel the spirit of a dead Persian artist which she named Bremba. Bremba was the owner of a pet tiger and despite him reassuring the circle that the tiger meant Alma no harm, she routinely found herself with scratches appearing during the seances all over her body, at times stretching from her neck right across her back to her waist. Fodor arranged for a trip to the cinema for Alma, suggesting that she might be able to astral project once more and whilst the experiment failed on that front, during the film, Alma produced a bunch of roses from thin air right in the middle of the picture. The roses, Fodor found easier to explain than much of the other recent phenomena. On their way to the cinema, Fodor had had Alma's bag checked and her cash counted. Before the film had started, Alma had told the investigators that she had needed to run across the road to buy her sanitary towels as her period had suddenly started and she excused herself for several minutes. The following day, whilst talking to Alma on the phone, Fodor asked her how much money she had in her bag, and the total, he calculated, aligned perfectly with the amount that she had had the night before, minus the price of a cinema ticket and a bunch of roses. In April, Fodor rejoined the seances, 
Les, however, was now becoming vocal about Alma's continued work at the Institute. Alma had been losing weight and had told Folor that she felt as if something was feeding on her. She also described feelings of wanting to do people harm. Fodor continued to push Alma in order to get to the bottom of the phenomena, and instead of backing off, he suggested the Institute double her pay to four pounds a week, which seemed to placate Les, and he then introduced the idea of having Alma submit to an X-ray before entering the seance room. Alma protested at first, saying that the machinery scared her and reminded her of hospitals. But once the technicians comforted her and explained that the machinery was quite different, she agreed to have her pelvis photographed. This was important for Fodor, who was now developing a theory that Alma had been sneaking items into the institute via her vagina and then excusing herself to the bathroom where she would remove them and hide them around her body beneath her clothing once she had changed. Quite sure that she would not submit to any sort of search requiring that level of intimacy, the X-ray was his only hope of uncovering the fraud. The first plate was taken of Alma's pelvis and the technicians took it to a van outside to develop. However, it soon became clear that they had bungled the operation. To his delight, Alma suggested that they redo the photos and this time he instructed the technicians to take two photographs, one of her pelvis and the other of her torso. On the same day that Horace Leaf, a psychical investigator and writer, published an article for the Two Worlds Journal on the marvel of Alma's mediumship, an X-ray developed outside of the Institute of her torso showed two objects pressed against her body, one in the shape of a pin and the other of a small heart. Fodor was alerted to the objects found on the print, but he kept it to himself, only to witness Alma report a small heart-shaped locket to everyone's great surprise. Everyone except Fodor. With the revelations brought about by the X-ray, Fodor had confirmed suspicions that he had long harboured, that at the very least, much of the phenomena witnessed at the Institute had been fraudulent. Now he intended to discover whether Almor was aware of the fraud or not. It occurred to Fodor that very possibly, much of the activity could have been the product of her subconscious mind, and much could have been compulsively undertaken. He enlightened the circle to his new findings and showed them the X-ray, instructing them to keep it a secret from Alma. If they were to get to the bottom of Alma's methods and motives, she must not be allowed to realise that they were aware of the deception. Whilst Fodor continued to find intrigue in the case from a psychoanalytical perspective, many others in the circle were far less amused by the outcome. As far as they could see, Alma had been deceiving them for months, and with all the items that she had apparently magicked from thin air, she was clearly a very sick woman. The public sittings were cancelled, using the excuse that they had placed excess strain on Alma, and from that point on, the Institute dialled them back to much smaller, more exclusive audiences, and things continued on largely as if nothing had changed. Alma continued to abhor objects and channel the spirit of Bremba, and still she suffered from tiger attacks, with new scratches appearing all over her body in every sitting. Worryingly, Alma told Fodor of how a spirit had been visiting her at night and forcing himself upon her. She also rang him on one occasion to tell him of how she had dreamt that a bat had flown into her room the previous night and bitten her neck. While she had lay in bed, she had felt paralysed and unable to move. The smell of bad meat had spread through the room whilst a cold weight climbed onto the bed next to her and she felt a pinch on her neck. The next morning, she had noticed two small puncture wounds just below her ear. Fodor told her on the phone that he would check them the next time she came to the Institute, but instead he sprung a surprise visit to Beverston Road that afternoon along with Dr Wills and his assistant Laurie Evans. They checked the bite marks and sure enough, there they were. Examining Mrs Fielding's neck, we found two irregular, fairly deep punctures behind the sternal mastoid muscle, a little more than an eighth of an inch apart. There were some faint parallel scratches around them. The skin was red and swollen. In Dr. Will's opinion, the scarring was not sufficiently advanced to show that the punctures were not caused within the last few hours. In other words, they might have been caused at midnight, as per Mrs. Fielding's story. Fodor was quite sure that the marks had not been made by any vampire that had flown in through her window, but it was no less disturbing. 
As he spoke to Alma, she told him of the vampire visitation in more detail and embellished her own feelings. Sometimes I feel that I am not here, that I am not really alive. I feel as if I had died on the operating table. It seems to me as if another person had taken possession of my body. I am often told things which I am supposed to know but don't. I used to tell my husband after my last kidney operation, I'm not really there, I am dead. You don't know it, you cannot really hear me. I used to touch them after that operation. They would not feel me or they would not hear me when I was talking. Since then, when I walk, I feel as if I were above the ground, floating along. You know that I'm always kind to animals, yet I have an awful feeling that I wish to hurt them. Last Monday, my cat had an accident. I found his back toe sliced off at the joint. I have a horrible feeling that I did it without knowing. Fodor made sure not to mention the words vampire nor Dracula when speaking to Alma concerning the bite marks, instead waiting for her to incriminate herself, yet she never did. Rather than just a tall story, Fodor instead began to consider a past trauma struggling to emerge from years of past oppression from Alma's conscious mind. During the next seance, Alma's spirit guide Brember suggested the investigators stake out the fielding's bedroom at night, poised to kill the vampire bat upon its return. This, he assured the group, would free Alma's spirit, which was currently residing inside the animal, and allow it to return to Alma. The group strangely gave the idea serious consideration, but instead, Fodor suggested that they take a softer approach, enlisting the aid of Eileen Garrett, a spirit medium friend of Fodor's, who could perform a therapeutic seance for Alma. Mrs. Garrett agreed to help, and the seance was carried out in Beveston Road, with the medium calling upon her own spirit guide, named Ivani, to mediate between the investigators and Alma. Ivani reassured Alma that she was a strong, talented woman, but warned her against the dangers of fraud, both for her reputation as well as for her own sake. Ivani then addressed Les, telling him not to be jealous of his wife's mediumship, nor to feel threatened by a career as a medium. The entire session seemed more like a session of marriage therapy than a seance, but then Mrs. Garrett herself was never confident that her own spirit guide was nothing more than a product of her own subconscious invention. By now, Fodor was convinced that Alma's recent troubles were not supernormal at all. Rather, the answers lay in her subconscious mind. The original phenomena in the house, he suggested, could well have been true. There was still much that he could not explain, but he believed that as the investigation wore on, Alma had begun to invent new activity in order to appease the investigators and keep the party rolling. He believed that Alma bore a subconscious wish for change, escape or self-expression, and she had used the seances as a vehicle to carry this out. He also considered the possibility that many of the more frightening stories of sleep paralysis and nighttime visitors from vampires and long-faced men creeping out of her wardrobe were the products of an oppressed memory of sexual trauma from her youth. Laurie Evans felt much the same, as he later wrote in his own summary of the case. On looking through my notes on the Thornton Heath case, made on my first visit to the house, I experienced afresh the feeling I had at the time. That is to say, an utter belief in the genuineness of the phenomena and also of the good faith of Mrs Fielding. In view of what we now know, this is important. Moreover, I find that having deprived her of the benefit of every doubt in regard to this phenomena, there still remain a number of incidents which defy a normal explanation. I am more than ever convinced that her reactions to the various breakages, etc. were entirely genuine. Her absolute terror in the initial stages was quite unmistakable. Fodor suggested to the circle that they might administer a truth serum to Alma in order to really find what had been going on behind her actions. But by now, the circle had had enough. They had had enough of both Alma's constant deception, which they saw as a personal affront, and of Fodor's constant psychoanalytical approach. Instead, they voted to terminate the investigation outright. Disappointed, Fodor took a holiday to France with his family in order to gain some perspective. Upon his return, however, he found himself ousted from his position at the Institute and all the members of the seance circle that had been involved with the investigation into Alma and Beveston Road rapidly distancing themselves, many requesting that if Fodor were to publish his findings in the case, that he should leave their names out of the final article. With little left for him in London, Fodor applied for a visa to America, 
where he believed the atmosphere was more sympathetic to mediums and mediumship. Despite uncovering fraud over and again, he still claimed that the matter of ghosts, poltergeists and mediumship was basically a psychological inquiry. Before leaving London, he delivered a copy of his notes on the investigation to Sigmund Freud, who was living in Hampstead after his escape from Nazism. Freud wrote to Fodor a few weeks later. Dear sir, perhaps you cannot imagine how vexatious the reading of such documents of experiments, precautions, evidence of witnesses and so on is for a reader to whom, to start with the acceptance of supernormal happenings, does not mean much, especially when they are concerned with such stupid tricks of so-called poltergeists. I have held out, however, and I have been richly rewarded. The way you deflect your interest from the question of whether the phenomena observed are real or have been falsified and turn it into a psychological study of the medium seem to me to be the right steps to take in the planning of research which will lead to some explanation of the occurrences in question. It is greatly to be regretted that the International Institute for Psychical Research was not willing to follow you in this direction. Furthermore, I regard as very probable the result you come to with the particular case. Naturally, it would be desirable to confirm it through a real analysis of the person, but that evidently is not feasible. Your manuscript is ready for you to fetch, with many thanks for sending me the interesting material. Yours truly, Sigmund Freud. For Fodor, who felt much mistreated by the reaction of the Institute after his hard work to establish their research, he saw the letter as vindication for his own methods and line of thinking on the case. On the 17th of March, 1939, Fodor sailed for New York, six months before war was declared with Germany. During the war, Alma Lezendon moved to a rural village in Devon. Lezendon volunteered for the Home Guard, whilst Alma volunteered as a nurse. Shortly after the end of the war, the International Institute for Psychical Research closed its doors for good. Fodor spent his time in America developing his own practice as a psychoanalyst. He later wrote of poltergeist psychosis, a symptom of repressed memories and past trauma. Whilst his theories on the Beveston Road case were unwelcome by spiritualists at the time, he was remarkably ahead of his time, and many of his psychoanalytical theories are now accepted amongst psychologists and form the basis of several theories amongst believers of the paranormal equally. He published his work on the case, On the Trail of the Poltergeist, in 1958, and though he changed the names of many of the subjects, he lays out the investigation for all to see and further embellish his theories. When all was over for the Thornton Heath poltergeist, we are left with a case that seems more like the history of fraudulent mediumship and fledgling psychology. However, it's easy to forget that in the beginning, several people wrote signed testimonies to a series of perplexing events that remain unexplainable. It seems likely that Fodor was correct in many of his assumptions concerning Alma and her motives for fraudulent activity, but what are we to make of his belief, which took several years to fully shake off, along with the belief of his assistant Laurie Evans, that much of the early phenomena were genuine? Despite Fodor's best efforts, he was still unable to dismiss everything that had happened entirely and was unable to secure evidence that could prove much of it a fraud. No matter if we believe the spiritualists, the psychoanalytical Fodor, or the enthusiastic Fodor of the early investigation, or a mix of something in between, the truth of much of the activity is now left to history. A footnote in an era when war loomed on the horizon and ghosts spoke in darkened rooms. So that was the story of Alma and her poltergeist more so it's the story of nandor fodor really there is just so much to unpack there so uh, we'll do that a little bit after these short advert breaks thanks for listening to dark histories this podcast is entirely independent and funded by myself and listener support so in order to do that i need to run a few ads our longtime advertising partner is audible and the reason i've stuck with them for so long is that they offer a service that I actually use and enjoy myself. And I do think it actually offers value to people like myself who enjoy podcasts. If you're unaware of what Audible is, it's an audiobook subscription service which charges a monthly fee in return for one credit 
which you're free to spend on any audiobook you like. The catalogue is huge, multilingual, and covers everything from fiction to series of lectures. They have an iOS, Android, and web app, and if you use more than one, they all sync up together so that you can listen on any of your devices without having to skip about. If you ever feel like you want to take a break from the subscription, you can do so and you get to keep all your previously bought books. And when you get into a drought, you can just fire it up again and start gaining credits seamlessly. Some of my favourite books on there to date are the complete Sherlock Holmes, which is read by Stephen Fry. And they've also got the original Exorcist book and just a huge history back catalogue. And I've really enjoyed all of those, basically. So if this sounds like something you might be interested in, head over to audible.com forward slash dark histories. And that's dark histories, all one word. And you can start a free trial that offers a monthly subscription with one free credit so that you can instantly pick an audiobook of your choice. If at the end of the trial, you feel like it's not really for you, you can just cancel it and it's cost you nothing and you get to keep your free book. So once again, that's audible.com forward slash dark histories or you can find the link in the show notes. So earlier I mentioned listener support, and there are a ton of ways that you can get involved and support Dark Histories. The main way is to become a Patreon patron. If you listen to a lot of podcasts, I'm sure you're familiar by now, but for those not so much, Patreon is a way to make a monthly pledge in return for some small perks. On the Dark Histories Patreon, I set my pledges as low as I can, really, with options for one, three, and five dollars per month. And for that, you gain things like early access episodes without these horrible ads, PDF notes, and resources that I make and find during my research for each episode. There's also access to the live stream archives and more. So if you enjoy the show and you think it's worth it to you, hop over to darkhistories.com and you can find all the ways that you can support, including our Patreon, or just check out the links in the show notes. If none of that appeals, then sharing it around with all your friends and family is equally as helpful and just as much appreciated. So if you're here, then thanks so much for not skipping the ads with that 30 second skip button and giving my hard sell a listen. I'll let you get back to the episode. Cheers. Welcome back. Interesting story. It's, I think, less about Alma and more about Nandor Fodor and his interesting take on the psychical research, I think. That's kind of what I was gunning for anyway, because I, I found that the most interesting. But still, to talk about the story and Alma Fielding, it's really hard to judge what we think happened, right? So, obviously, she hoaxed a lot of it. But his assistant seemed to believe that, at least at the start, the phenomena was real. And Nando Fodor, later in his career, wrote about it very much as if he didn't believe it. But that took him a long time to come to that conclusion. And in his earlier writings on the subject, he's, he's more on board, even after he finds out that she was hoaxing in the room. So that was quite interesting, like, like how much of it was real and how much of it was fake, I guess. Or, I mean, I say how much of it was real, but, you know, how much of it was unexplainable. To be honest, to me, when I read Nandor Fodor's book on this, on the trail of the poltergeist, I, I didn't think really any of the evidence suggested that it was real. He, he sort of subdivided a lot of the evidence up to being like like uh, non circumstantial and and pointed out parts of evidence that he thought were was were more uh, interesting than others and things like that um, that were going on in Beverstone Road. But for me, none of it really seemed that, like that legit. It all seemed it all seemed like things that could easily have been faked by somebody in the house. So I I didn't really think very much of it in all honesty. Probably the bit that interested me more, or the bit that kind of stuck out to me as being like, okay, how do you explain that? And and no one really did explain it very well, was the tiger scratches. And at first, when I read this, I, I, I could explain it. You know, she was getting scratches on her arms. Okay, big deal, right? Like, anyone can do that. 
But there were points where she was getting scratches from her the top of her shoulder blades right the way across her back down to her waist. Now, I'm not sure you can do that yourself without someone noticing. <laughs> that was quite, quite interesting. Probably if you've listened to the podcast a lot by now, you know that I tend to be quite sceptical and, and a bit sort of maybe jaded about this kind of stuff anyway. So I'm not really prone to believing that she was being scratched by a spirit tiger. <laughs> I'm not sort of suggesting that. But at the same time, I just don't know how she did that. And, and that intrigues me as much as it being a spirit tiger in a way. It, it, it's equally as interesting because I just don't know how she would have done that. I say like scratching your arms, that, that's not so interesting. Okay, I could understand how she might have done that, right? She just scratched her arms. But how she would have scratched like massive gashes across her back, I don't know. I really don't know. And equally the puncture marks on her neck, again, I don't, I don't really know. Of course... Having never seen them and not there's no pictures or anything like that, you can't really tell. And you can, you've only really got Fodor's kind of word for it in his book, where he says that they were quite deep. Again, I'm I'm not going to jump to the conclusion that oh, well, I can't explain this. Therefore, it must have been a vampire bat that came through a window. You know, I'm not like that sort of leadable. But at the same time, I don't know how she might have done that. Like I suppose. The puncture marks on the neck are slightly more um, easy to explain than the scratch marks. But still, I'm not sure if I... It's, it's just grim. I'm not sure I'd want to... That I mean, that's quite painful, surely, making like deep puncture marks on your neck underneath your ear just to prove a point or, or you know, to, to, to sort of try and get away with a hoax. But then I suppose if you're desperate and you're, you're embarrassed of maybe getting caught out, you might do those things. I don't know. But it seems harsh. But what do I know? Um, yeah, so so that was all really interesting. The whole, you know, how much of it you want to take as like a hoax and how much of it you want to take as le- legit phenomena. Where, where you want to draw that line is quite interesting, I suppose. But, but mainly, you know, I, I found like this episode interesting because I really like Fodor's approach to this. I really liked his psychoanalytical approach and I really liked how... It was so ahead of its time in many respects. On the one hand, you've got the spiritualists that are believing that there's still such things as elementals that are controlling kinetic energy and all this kind of stuff. And on the other hand, you've got Fodor coming in, like on you know, on the other end of the spectrum, you've got Fodor coming in and saying, well, perhaps it was her subconscious that w- was sort of manifesting all these things without her realising. And I, and I think... Sometimes he takes it a bit too far. I think there's there's a middle ground somewhere that that needs to be met, and I, and I think he he does sort of go a bit off the wall with his psychoanalytical approach. But it was just so cool to read that he was coming up with that at that time when everyone else was. You know, he got quite. I wouldn't say persecuted for this, but you know, people didn't like his attitude towards this. That that they found it offensive in many respects i think like they, they thought that it was like he was challenging them all the time um and not believing them and being a skeptical uh being a skeptic and, and whatnot so i thought that was really cool like yeah he was kind of a maverick really you know like in his field and and i and i, I like that i thought that was cool um and and say so that was why i wanted to write the episode you know it was about alma but it was more about fodor than the story, if you like. It was more about his kind of sort of approach to it all. And I like the fact that everyone sort of spoke about him as though he was this really, like, excitable, enthusiastic guy, you know. Like, he would get really into the the fun of it. It was So it wasn't all about kind of, like, psychical research and, and being straight and uh, strict with, with everything, you know. Like, he was very, like, yeah, he wanted to do, like, proper research and he debunked people if they needed debunking but at the same time he was respectful and still had an open mind and I like that about him despite the fact that he'd seen so much fraud and uncovered so much lies and all the rest of it and was very skeptical he still came at it with an open mind you know he still seemed to go into everything with an enthusiasm to see what might happen um and sometimes i feel like he was a little tongue-in-cheek for example 
I read about his involvement with Jeff, um, the talking mongoose, which I'm sure you, you've probably heard that story. I was going to do it for Dark Histories once, but never got round to it and, and probably never will do it because it's, it's kind of a big case that's been done many times. But when he kind of um, got involved with the talking mongoose case, he was very like tongue in cheek with it. You know, he was writing the mongoose letters that were, was all, um, he went to go and visit. And because he didn't get a chance to speak to the mongoose when he was there, he, he wrote the mongoose a letter saying like, you know, oh, it's a shame I didn't get to meet you. Maybe next time we can we can hang out. I'll bring you some biscuits and things like this. And I really liked that. He He, he seemed to do it with, you know, do his psychical research. Um, with a smile on his face and and you know you can't really sort of complain too much about people that go into things with that sort of enthusiasm right it's really uh admirable i think that he wasn't jaded and he'd seen a lot of fraud and that sound covered a lot of fraud himself and yet he still went in with a smile on his face and, and an intrigue and almost like a childlike enthusiasm for what he was doing uh, so I really liked him for that and I say and then then you add on top of that his psychoanalytical approach which you say was pretty maverick and ahead of its time and and I think you've got like the recipe for a pretty cool guy there so yeah that was that I, I don't want to dwell too much on, on the rest of it it was it's been a long episode um and say where you want to draw the line and what you think was real and what wasn't I'll leave that up to you. But I thought it was interesting anyway. I, and I thought it was interesting. And I, I certainly thought Alma's kind of the way she hoaxed things towards the end. Um, I thought that was interesting as well. So, yeah, I hope you like the story. If you're a patron, stick around because I'll, I'll be coming back after the after the outro just for a little chat, I guess. Um, but otherwise, um, thanks very much for listening. Say, if you've got any stories for the Christmas campfire episode, um, do feel free to write them in. Um, so I really look forward to that. I, re I really look forward to making the episode and I, I really look forward to everyone's submissions. So, you know, definitely whack them in. If you've got a story you want to share, definitely whack it in. And don't feel like um, sort of self-conscious or anything like that about it. It's all good fun. And, you know, everyone uh, just wants to, listen to your stories so if you've got one say do definitely whack it in it it will be um another excellent episode i hope another excellent christmas campfire uh, and, it, and if you're not sure about the christmas campfires go back and check them out um so they're, they're pretty much an annual tradition now this will be i think the fourth christmas campfire episode which is bonkers so yeah if you want to get involved say um email it to me socials at darkhistories.com Otherwise, if you want to contact me for any other reasons, you can do so. Contact at darkhistories.com. Also, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. Just search Dark Histories. All the links are in the show notes or on the website, which is darkhistories.com. And yeah, you'll also find ways to support and all that if you want to do that. But, you know, don't feel like you have to. So thanks very much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed the story. And I'll see you all very soon for the next episode, which will be the last episode of this season boom 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 so that's exciting stuff thanks very much for listening i'll see you all real soon take care sleep tight <laughs>